Um, Ole Andreas uh, Tistetl says, sorry, I probably got your name wrong. I apologize. How do you interpret Genesis 32 when Jacob wrestles with God? God bless you. Um, Genesis 32, Jacob wrestles with God. Um, there's the tough thing about it, how to saying, how do I interpret it is you probably have some specific things in your mind about that. Um, about like the interpretation points. What about this part or that part? And I, I may not answer that as I talk about it right now, but let's just look at this. Um, so verse 13, I think we'll start. So, so he stayed there that night and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau. Okay. Well, he sends out, where is the passage I'm looking for? Ah, look at that. Titles are so helpful. Verse 22. The same night he arose and took two wives with his his two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And here's what it says. A man wrestled with him until the breaking of dawn of the day. When the man saw, it's, it, it's, let's just highlight, when the man saw, does that mean it had to be human? I, I have to look up the Hebrew. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So interesting because he's at the literal lowest point in his life right now. And here he's prevailed. And there's an irony in the prevail in, in the way Jacob prevails because he loses, but he won't let go. He's injured, but he just won't let go. He just he's desperate and he's got nothing else. And he sent all of his stuff onto his brother, and he's alone and he's got nothing, and he's worried he's gonna die. And he's like, You've prevailed. There's an irony in the way in which he prevailed. Um, then Jacob asked, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you asked my name? And there he blessed him. <laughs> it doesn't tell him his name. And then and Jacob interprets this. He goes, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel saying, for I have seen God face to face. And yet my life has been delivered. The beginning of the passage, Jacob wrestles with a man. Let's just take it that you're asking, who's he wrestling with? How do I interpret that? He wrestles with a man. It says, this man seems to be more than merely a man, right? You've striven with God and with men and have prevailed. He's also supernatural. He just touches the hip. He causes supernaturally things like that to happen. Then Jacob wants to know, tell me the name of the one whom I, who I'm, who I'm dealing with here. And he goes, why do you ask my name? That's all he says. Why do you ask my name? No answer. This is similar to, um, another place where we have what I would say is a, and there's a footnote here that'll help us find it, where we have a similar account like this. Uh, before we move on, just know Jacob then interprets this in a way where he seems to feel like he has somehow encountered God, somehow directly encountered God. That's and he thinks he's he's been delivered. He he didn't die. He didn't suffer judgment or something. So it's it's some gracious, merciful moment. Now in Judges thirteen, um, we have a similar account, and this is about the birth of of Samson, I believe. And, um, the man and his wife are there and this, this whole, it's this whole angel of the Lord thing, right? Um, it says the angel of the Lord says to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. And they're trying to, they have this similar encounter. They have a man who's sort of a man of God in some sense, but they're suspicious that he might be more than that. They ask his name. They want to bring honor to him in that sense. And he won't reveal it to them. He won't reveal his name to them. And then he seems to be um, treated as though he is actually God himself in the passage. Um, so uh, let me, let me summarize this way. And then I'll point you to my Jesus in the old Testament series. where I actually teach through both of those passages in detail. Okay. So the Jesus in the old Testament series, where I talk about the angel of the Lord, there's a particular angel of the Lord, um, video I've done. In fact, a uh, mod, if, if a mod would put the angel of the Lord video in the live chat, that would be great. And I'll link it down below afterwards for those who want to find it in the, in the description. Um, here's a man who's more than a man who's then talked about as though he is God. This happens in scripture a number of times. I take them to be the pre-incarnate manifestations of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. He doesn't reveal his name to them. It's different than Jesus in his incarnation where he actually took on human form. 
He was born into a human. Okay, okay, okay. All right, thanks. I think we're back. No, we're not. Stinking internet. Just waiting, making sure. Okay. I'll take that to, that we're back. I'll put the link down below for that video, but but here's the summary. You've got this man who's more than a man and there's mystery around him. There's something yet to be revealed about him. He's directly called God in some places, this angel of the Lord character. And then um, I think that all takes its, is all a shadow, a sample of what Jesus will be when he actually really truly becomes incarnate. So that would be my view. That's how I would interpret it. There's probably other questions you'd have about it, but that'll give you something. 